For those who are canned store meal, please kneel at this time. Dear Lord, may this prayer rightfully give all the love, honor, and glory to our Creator, Jesus Christ. May he send the Spirit to convey through Dale to give us the understanding of this portion of the book of Revelation. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is mediating today, on our behalf. Amen.
We are so blessed to have so many different talents within this church. And another one is Verla and her storytelling. She's going to have a story at this time. I picked out another story from the book that I had last time. And they are true stories. Sometimes it's hard to believe that they are true stories, but it shows how God's nearness to us and his love for us, he wants to get the people to learn of him so he can come and bring them home. The story I picked out today is in, takes place in Asia on an island. And um, the people there lived in villages. They, home was there in villages. And then they had tracts of land farther out from the village where they would go and work. And in this area, they planted rice. And in the um, rice fields, they would make mud walls because they needed water on the rice. And with the mud walls that they made, they could have water in the area there. and that would keep the water there on the rice. So a farmer was working out there on his rice field and trying to get his mud walls all ready so he could flood the rice with water. He looked, sometimes the farmers owned water buffalo and they would use them to plow with. We don't have water buffaloes here in this country, do we? We have tractors and things like that. And they could use the water buffalo to plow their land and then they use them for uh, pulling carts or for milk from them too. Well, this farmer was working out there one day, and he saw a big, big water buffalo coming. And he thought, I hope he doesn't come in my area, but he did, and he broke down part of his wall. He said, shoo, shoo, get out of here. I don't want you here. And the buffalo started away. And the farmer got back to trying to repair his mud walls. And as he was working, he looked up again, and there was that big old buffalo coming again. And he thought, who in the world owns that one? I don't know, but I'll have to get him out of here. And he looked for a stick, and he got a stick and was going toward this buffalo to shoo him out of there again because he didn't want him to break down his mud walls. And as he was going over to the buffalo, the buffalo came up to him and stopped. And he opened his mouth and he said, the Lord is coming soon. The Lord is coming soon. And then he turned and went away. And the farmer thought, my goodness, did I hear and see what I thought I did? Did that buffalo talk to me? He went on repairing his mud wall. And then he went back home and talked to his wife. And he said, can you believe it? A buffalo came and talked to me. He said the Lord was coming. 
well, we better not tell anybody else about that because they'll think I'm crazy. His wife said, all right, we won't tell anybody then. In their village, there was a couple of students that were studying for the ministry that came to give meetings at night. They were from the Seventh-day Adventist College, and the farmer and his wife weren't very interested in religion, so they decided not to go to the meetings. Well, as the meetings went on, and they got to hearing about what the students were talking about, the farmer said to his wife one day, let's go to the meeting just tonight. We'll go just once, and that will be enough. She said, okay, let's go. So that night, they decided to go to the meeting. They got to the meeting. Guess what the, one of the boys was talking on that night? He was telling them that Jesus was going to come, and he was going to come pretty soon. The farmer couldn't hardly contain himself listening to that message. And after it was all done that night, he said to, to those that were there yet, guess what? A water buffalo talked to me one day, and he told me the same thing. So the farmer's wife thought, oh, these messages must really be from God. So they came to other mess uh, hear other messages, and they were from the Bible, and they believed, and they gave their hearts to Jesus. Now today, there is a Seventh-day Adventist church in that village, and they praise God that he had the buffalo talk to them, and also the boys come and give them a message. God is good, isn't he, to give us everything we need to believe in him. Thank you. Thank you, Verla. Our scripture reading today is taken from uh, Revelation chapters 8 and 9. And I've asked LaSong to do this, and she has gotten a troop to help us with this. Revelation 8 and 9 is where we start talking about the, the Revelation 7 trumpets. And a lot of it is hieroglyphic. So listen carefully to what they're talking about, and then we will begin to try and unpack some of that information. Okay, good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Um, this, as, Dale, as Dr. Sinnott said, is a, revelation, a reading of Revelation 8 and 9, and it will be translated from the complete Jewish Bible. Um, let's just bow our heads quickly. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this blessed Sabbath day. Thank you for this privilege of reading your word. May our eyes be open and our spirits quickened and our resolve steadfast by the power of your Holy Spirit to do thy will in these last days. We thank you and ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Revelation 8. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, when the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven for what seemed like half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven shofars. Another angel came and stood at the altar with a gold incense bowl, and he was given a large quantity of incense to add to the prayers of all God's people. On the gold altar in front of the throne, the smoke of the incense went up, and with the prayers of God's people from the hand of the angel before God. Then the angel took the incense bowl, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it down on the earth. And there followed peals of thunder, voices, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. 
Now the seven angels with the seven shofars prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his shofar. And there came hail and fire mingled with blood. And he thrown down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up. A third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded his shofar. And what looked like an enormous blazing mountain was hurled into a into the sea. A third of the sea turned in, turned to blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded his so far. And a great star, blazing like a torch, fell into the sky, fell from the sky, onto the, onto the third of the rivers and onto the springs of the water. The name of the star was Bitterness, and the third of the water became bitter, and many people wa died from the water that had been turned bitter. The fourth angel sounded his shofar. And a third of the sun was struck, also a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that the third of them were darkened, and the day had a third less light, and the, 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 and the night likewise. Then I looked and I heard a long eagle, a lone eagle, give a loud cry, as, I, as it flew amid, amid heaven, woe, woe, woe the people living on earth because of the remaining blasts from the three angels who have yet to sound their shofars. The, fish, the fifth angel sounded his shofar. And I saw a star that had fallen out of, of heaven onto the earth, and he was given the key to the shaft leading down to the abyss. He opened the shaft of the abyss, and there went up smoke from the shaft like the smoke of a huge furnace. The sun was darkened, and the sky too, by the smoke from the shaft. Then out of the smoke onto the earth came locusts, and they were given power like the scorpions, the power scorpions have on earth. They were instructed not to harm the grass on the earth, any green plant, any tree, but only the people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. The locusts were not allowed to kill them, only to inflict pain on them, for five months, and the pain they caused was like the pain of a stinging scorpion. In those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. Now these locusts looked like horses outfitted of for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold, and their faces were like human faces. They had hair like woman's hair, and their teeth were like those of lions. Their chests were like iron breastplates, and, their sound, and the sound their wings made were like the roar of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails like those of scorpions with stings, and in their tails was the power to hurt people for five months. They had as the king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in our language, destroyer. The first woe has passed but there are still two woes to come. Six angels sounded his shofar. And I heard a voice from four horns of the gold altar before God, saying to the sixth angel, the one with the shofar, least four angels that are bound at the great river Euphrates. And they were released. These four angels had been kept ready for this moment, for the for this day, in month and year, to kill a third of mankind, the number of cavalry soldiers was 200 million. I heard the number. Here is how the horses looked in the vision. The riders had breastplates that were fire red, iris blue, and sulfur red, yellow. The horses' heads were like lion's heads, and from their mouths issued fire, smoke, and sulfur. It was these three plagues that killed a third of mankind, the fire, smoke, and the sulfur issuing from the horses' mouths. For the, 
he, for the power of the horses was in their mouths, and also in their tails, for their tails were like snakes with heads, and with them they could cause injury. The rest of mankind, those who were not killed by these plagues, even then did not turn from what they had made with their own hands. They did not stop worshipping demons and idols, made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, which cannot see or hear walk, or walk. Nor did they turn from their murdering, their involvement with the, with the cult, and with drugs and their sexual immorality, or their stealing. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Isn't an E flat sound an awful lot like a shofar? <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for the reading. Revelation uh, has been a, a fascination of mine, and I've been working on uh, trying to understand that more. As a child, I remember going to uh, evangelistic meetings, and we we hear about. Uh, Revelation, and it always seemed that it was mere mysterious, weird animals that were uh, had awful portrayals and so on and so forth. And as you just heard in Revelation 8 and 9, again, there's just a lot of hieroglyphics that are seemingly difficult to understand. And as I have studied and read many hundreds of pages, it is apparent to me that it really is... Uh, an open book that is for our understanding. Remember when uh, Daniel had his prophecies, God told him to close the book. But the, the book has been opened and now much of it is history. And so we can verify the prophecies and that's for our benefit. But there, there are a few things yet to come, like the plagues. And notice you, they did not read Trumpet 7. Trumpet 7 is in uh, chapter 10. Trumpet 7, like seal 7, is the time when Jesus comes. That's the whole point of the book of Revelation. Not all of these weird images and so forth. They just are symbols to help us perhaps be confused unless we're willing to sit down and do some study and figure out what they're all about. It's very interesting that it's so important that Jesus appeared to John on Patmos and told him the things that were to come. Uh, this is, in fact, Jesus appeared to John and said, these are messages from me, but they are also about me. You see, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ that we're here to talk about. Not all of these other things, but it's symbols that he uh, hid from people's uh, understanding, perhaps, over many hundreds of years. Revelation is often called the apocalypse, which means an unveiling or an uncovering, a revealing of Jesus. That's what the revelation is. It's revealing Jesus. He's revealing himself, and he's telling us where, where we came from and where we are headed. And if we are not headed there with him, it's purely our choice, not his. In fact, his message, uh, the, the whole point is that it's revealing that Jesus is coming again. And there are enough satisfactions of prophecy over the thousands of years that his prophecies are true and we can believe the one that he is coming. It is so important that he puts the messages in mouths of water buffalo. I think that is absolutely amazing. And if, if I'm going to be so dull that he's going to have to have a dumb animal come and talk to me to get my attention, I better pay attention. Revelation is, is divided in two halves. The first half, verse, uh, chapters 1 through 14, are historical. The last half, 15 through 22, are eschatological. Eschatology, a branch of theology concerned with the final events in the history of the world or of humankind. A review. I have to keep reviewing for myself because I, I just have a hard time grasping all of this and putting it in my head. So we will spend a few minutes going through what we've talked about before. 
I initially wanted to talk about the seven trumpets, but they were just, they're beyond my understanding at this point, and I can't really put it all down. So we're going to talk about the first today. There were seven blessings, as you'll recall. The first blessing was in Revelation 1.3. And it said, uh, Jesus is telling John, is blessed are those who read, and thank you all for reading. You have received a blessing today for doing so. Blessed are those who listen, therefore we all have a blessing today, so your attendance has not been for nothing. You have been blessed today, and you can't, deny, you can't escape it. And then also are blessed are those who keep the words of the prophecy. That is our challenge. There was a prologue, which is an introduction that followed that uh, blessing. It was verse 4, and it said, Grace and peace to you from Jesus. That's to you and me. Grace and peace. The world is looking for peace. You turn on the news and you don't find much of evidence of it. And I would maintain that in this day and age, you and I are going to have to go by ourselves, talk to Jesus on our knees or while we're walking, and then I can have peace irrespective of what happens in the world or irrespective of what happens to me personally. Then there's the doxology, a praise. An expression of praise to God is the doxology. Verse 6, to the one who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests, a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him, that's Jesus, be glory and might forever and ever. Amen. And what do you say? Amen. Then we talked about the seven churches. Jesus walks among the ch seven churches because he cares. He cares about you and I. The first church was Ephesus. And as you uh, see, that began down here. The seven churches and they represent seven periods in history. Uh, Ephesus was the first one, first century A.D., Laodicea, 1844 to now and until Jesus comes. We is Laodicea. To the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden can uh, lampstands. The seven stars and the seven lampstands both stand for the seven churches. Christ has complete control over the whole church, then and now, including this one. His presence is in the church, and he has full knowledge of the church's situation and needs, including Richland Center Church. It, re it, uh, it, it spoke of conditions at that time in the church of Ephesus, it also represents a period of time in history, the first century A.D. The, remember, Jesus' commission was, go tell the world. And they did. They took their commission very seriously. The Ephesus experience continues today. Remember, they Christ's admonition to them was that uh, they abandoned their early love. And then he said, uh, go out and tell the world. And they did. And, you know, that Ephesus message continues today. Some of us sitting in here periodically, and it happens more than once, lose our early love. Our early love or our attention to Jesus, our, our, our um, desire to spend more time with him. The world distracts us. And then sometimes when we're distracted, we try to make up for it by good works, which the people in Ephesus did. Coming to church and paying your tithe and, and praying and opening your Bible a few times a week or a few times per month. But you know, we start, then start talking about relationship and behaviors. And I think all of this is about God trying to tell us, your relationship with me is what I'm really concerned about. Behaviors I am concerned about, yes, but you can't put behaviors before relationship. If your relationship with me is good, then I'm not really too much worried about what you do. And if you do get off the track, reestablish the relationship and behaviors will be better. Throughout history, Christians have often found themselves strained between love on one side and obedience on the other. In emphasizing strongly the love aspect of the gospel, 
obedience to the requirements of the gospel can easily be disregarded. In focusing on duty, the persevering of sound doctrine and often exposing heresy and fighting against it, Christians very often lose love for each other. Upholding doctrine and church order without focusing on Christ is useless. And religion not based on the gospel has no value. It is rather lifeless and dead. Sounds like Laodicea. Genuine religion is Christ-centered. It is based on both the vertical and the horizontal relationships characterized by love for Christ and love for each other. Laodicea, as I mentioned, is us. Then we went to the throne room, chapters 4 and 5. In the throne room was the sealed scroll, and no one, John started crying. He said, no one was able to open the scroll, and it had seven seals on. Then enters Jesus. He is the one that was worthy. And when he is in, was enthroned in heaven, which began at Pentecost, all heaven bows to worship Jesus. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood from the tribe and nation. Worthy is the slain lamb to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And all heaven and all the heavenly beings bowed down and worshiped the lamb. The seven seals. With the breaking of the seals, a series of events take place on the earth. When you open one of the seals, the scroll cannot be opened because there's still six sealing it. So the seals represent a series of events to take place on the earth. The events are intended to wake God's people from their apostate condition, lead them to repentance, and move them toward a positive relationship with God. So they're to wake us up, to lead us to repentance and to move us to a relationship with him. The first seal, as you recall, was the white horse and the rider. The horsemen characterized Christians and their response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The white horse and rider portrays the ongoing progress of the gospel throughout Christian history from John's day to now and to the second coming. So you see the first seal deals with a period of time that is the spread of the gospel during, uh, after the apostles' time, during the first century AD, but it's continuing now because that's our great commission, still spreading the gospel to the world. The progress of the gospel began at Pentecost. The disciples fulfilled the gospel commission, go ye into all the world. Christ will continue the triumphant expansion of his kingdom until the total conquest is achieved. Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The trumpets, which you heard about. The first trumpet. If the chauffeur was ready to blow, we'd hear it again now. That really was awesome. Um, the first trumpet. Most biblical scholars maintain that Jesus referred here to the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, there's a lot of study and a lot of history and a lot of things to, to look at. I'm just going directly to the, to, the, to the end of the story. So, if the first trumpet is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in, by the Romans in A.D. 70, the very event that he described in his eschatological discourse on the Mount of Olives. See, Jesus talked about all of this uh, with his disciples. He talked about the destruction of Jerusalem and also referred to himself, destroy the temple and in three days I'll raise it up. But he also said that when you destroy Jerusalem, there won't be a stone left on top of another. In fact, Jerusalem was leveled so well by the Romans that you could hardly tell that there had ever been a building there. In the first trumpet is symbolized God's weapons of judgment used against his own people, against the Jews. He's not talking now about the apostate Romans or the non-believing Romans, he's talking about his people, the Jews. It's only because they did not have that relationship with them and they were based totally upon their behaviors that God had to send them judgments, hoping that they might get the picture that they need relationship. When they lose their relationship, God will do almost anything to get our attention. 
Hail and fire mixed with blood portray the symbolic language the divine judgment poured upon God's own people who rejected his covenant and became the oppressors and persecutors of the followers of Christ. You see, it was, it was not just the Romans that crucified Jesus. Who was it that crucified Jesus? You and I. The Jews at that time. God's very own people missed the boat. They, they got more involved in behavior than in relationship. And we tend to be guilty of the very same thing. Let us not crucify him anew. The first trumpet still sounds today. Let us not be the people of God who have the truth but reject it, thus figuratively crucify Christ anew. Those who have the light yet reject the relationship offered will meet judgment destruction. That's what his message is all about. The gospel needs behavior based on relationship with Jesus. Relationship cannot be obtained by prescribed behaviors i.e. relationship with Jesus leads to right behaviors. Behaviors or right actions do not necessarily lead to relationship. They're only actions. Revelation 3.20, Jesus said, Behold, I am standing at the door and knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. In other words, he's ready and able and more than anxious to come in and help me in all circumstances of my life today tomorrow and the next day but he won't throw open the door and barge in he leaves that up to me this is the DSPV I John saw seven angels who stand before God these seven angels have not been mentioned before in the Bible their position, who stand before God, characterizes their readiness for service. And it's quite possible these seven angels are the same angels who later, in Revelation 15 and 16, pour out the seven last plagues. And seven trumpets were given them by God. The shofar is the instrument heralding the end time coming of God in judgment. Verse 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar of burnt offering in the courtyard. The angel had a golden censer and received the incense with the prayers of the saints. Remember seal five, the saints or the martyrs were under the altar crying to God, how long, how long before you're going to administer justice to those who killed us, your people. And regarding the incense, Revelation 5, 8 says, incense are the prayers of the saints. And the smoke of the incense, with the prayers of the saints, ascended before God. Here is firm assurance that the prayers of the saints, martyrs, perhaps you and I, beneath the altar reach the throne of grace and are heard by God in heavenly places. Suddenly the scene changed. The angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it down upon the earth. Throwing coals on the fire down upon the earth symbolizes judgment action. Note, the fire that comes to the earth is from the same altar on which the prayers of the saints were offered. The censer which normally served to offer incense now becomes the symbol of judgment in response to the prayers. This symbolic scene shows that it is in answer to the prayers of the saints that God's seven trumpet judgments fall on the earth and its inhabitants. It assures us that God's people are not forgotten. You and I are not forgotten. And that our prayers are heard and they are answered. Then there was the demonstration of divine wrath by peals of thunder and voices and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Recall Mount Sinai when God came down to his people after they left Egypt and gave the commandments to Moses and he was in the mountaintop and there was thunder and lightning and earthquakes and noise and they said, Moses, you go talk to God. You know, that's a little much for us, unfortunately. This represents God's answer to the prayers of his people. He's preparing to bring his righteous judgments and vengeance upon those who viciously harass and oppress his faithful people. And as we've mentioned before, you know, uh, uh, oppression of Christians around the world is extremely 
uh, prevalent today. Did I just this past week I heard on the news where in Nigeria the 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 rebels as they are getting ready for uh, uh, elections are out massacring the the Christians by hundreds or thousands, and that's just in one spot in our world. Revelation eight six. The seven angels and the seven trumpets are signaled now to blow their trumpets and herald the woes about to be sent upon the earth and its inhabitants. The trumpet woes are judgments against the enemies of God's people leading to the deliverance of the oppressed faithful. Keep in mind here that the trumpets are the uh, judgments against the enemies of God, whether they have been his children beforehand or if they are just the, the people not even pretending to be Christians. Whereas the, the seals dealt with the, uh, uh, I'll call them judgments of God, to his people saying, shape up. I want a relationship with you. At each trumpet sound, a chain of events takes place on the earth. The events are a series of interventions of God in history in response to the prayers of his people. The first angel sounded his trumpet, there was hail and fire and blood hurled to the earth. A portion, a third of Satan's kingdom experienced divine judgment. Hail, fire and blood represent God's judgment on the nations in opposition to God and his people. Also a portion or one third of the trees and grass that represents God's people or Israel, you and I, who had become unfaithful to the covenant and thus are equated with the opponents. You see, so that once we have been uh, good uh, tenders to church and we read and then we decide no um, devil somehow leads us far away we're no different than the opponents that, uh, of Christ that have been opponents all along the biblical evidence leads us to conclude that the first trumpet blast portrays the consequences visited upon those who rejected and crucified Jesus and opposed the gospel God's own people, the Jews, who rejected his covenant and became oppressors and persecutors of the followers of Jesus. Thus, the first trumpet represents the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 by the Roman armies who starved, crucified, shot with arrow, and hacked to death hundreds of thousands of Jews. Jerusalem fell to the enemies because they fell away from God. God gave completely of himself to solve the sin problem. He has satisfied all the requirements of justice. Our responsibility is relationship with him and with others, not judgment. I want to uh, briefly tell you about the destruction of Jerusalem. It was a fascinating story. I have some notes there, but I'm gonna, I'm, I will see how I can remember that. In AD, I mean BC 63, Pompeii, you remember the, you often remember the city Pompeii that was destroyed by the um, volcano. General Pompeii uh, was able to go to Syria, which included uh, Judea, and he captured them. And Judea became a part of the Roman province. Many times uh, when people were taken and made part of the Roman province, they, they considered it a privilege and a blessing. But in Judea, Jerusalem and the surrounding area, there were Jews that became very adamantly opposed to the Roman emperor. And so they would, they would start fighting. I mean, we don't see Christians in our churches today doing that, of course, but back then they did. And so they would, they would start fighting and there were many battles called the Judean Wars. Over and over there were. And, and in any one battle, there could be as many as 20,000 dead Jews. Lots of them. That went on over and over uh, for now uh, 120 years. We get to about the mid-60s A.D. Temple, is, Jerusalem's not destroyed yet. 60s A.D. Emperor Nero. You all know about Nero. He called one of his generals from Britain the, to come down, and his name was Vespasian. He had him come down, and he wanted him to go and straighten things out down in Jerusalem in Judea. Vespasian had a son named Titus. Vespasian and Titus went... Uh, no, I'm ahead of my story. Before Vespasian, there was a name named uh, Cestius Gallus. Cestius Gallus, he was a general. He went down there, he was going to solve the issues. This was before 60 AD. 
uh, he was going to get down there and solve the issues and straighten things out. He went down there with two legions. The legion of soldiers is 6,000. So he had 12,000. He had a whole bunch of auxiliaries. So he went down there and he was going to straighten things out and he was winning the battle and boom, he got cold feet. He turned around and fled. And the Jews went to the, the hills surrounding Jerusalem and as he fled, he picked them off. He picked off about 6,000 of them. And the Jews went back to town feeling pretty good about themselves. Uh, some of them were a little frightened because they thought, oh, now what are the Romans going to do? And some of the other Jews said, no, let's just calm this down. Let's, let's, let's participate with the Jews. Let's be friends. Let's, let's make a civil, nice society. That's when Nero called Vespasian and Titus to come down and in A.D. 66... He, they were in there fighting and they were winning battles come uh, and many Jews would, would die in those battles still come AD 70 spring of AD 70 April, May Vespasian and Titus Titus his son went and attacked Jerusalem it was Pentecost so Jerusalem was full of Jews they went in with battering rams they went in and they just ransacked the city Dead bodies all over. The historians say that there were 250,000, anywhere between 250,000 and a million Jews dead in the cities. Amazing, amazing destruction. Jesus foretold all of that. And he said, you know, because, because you didn't uh, listen to me, you didn't develop a relationship with me, you actually fought against me. I'm sending this to say, listen, I told you, you know, 1,500 years before Jesus, God did the same thing. He sent Babylon because his, his people did not follow his ways. They went to Babylon. And even with hard times, we, we tend to either get stronger or we get more wuss, wussy. In hard times, we can become stronger and go and learn to depend upon God more. And I think that's his intent. Or we can just say, I don't know why God's doing this to me. How can he, how can he, and all, you know, so on. And we can become very discouraged. The intent is for God to say, listen, I am here. I am here through all the circumstances. I can and I will take care of you. There's an arch in Rome. It depicts the destruction of Jerusalem including the gold, when they destroyed uh, Rome, they took the golden menorah, which now sits in Jerusalem. But on, on top of this arch of Titus in Rome is this depiction of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. It's very much historical fact. It's not just a cleverly devised story. So too, he has given us prophecy and it will as surely be fulfilled as the prophecies of old. You can count on it. Let us develop a relationship with Jesus so that we're not caught unprepared. The new Jerusalem is a reality. In summary, the first blessing for he who reads, hears, and keeps, it's relationship and behavior. The first church, Ephesus, was relationship versus behavior. The first seal, relationship and behavior, relationship with Jesus, the gospel, and taking it to the world. The first trumpet is lack of relationship and bad behavior. He is coming again. He is coming again. He said so. And because of the other prophecies and the other examples in the, in the book, and I would also say because of your relationship with God, with Jesus, you have many evidences to prove that he does interact with your life. A water buffalo may not come and talk to you, but if he does, pay attention. And so my witness becomes how God interacts with me. And I have then the privilege of telling the world about Jesus. Oh, yes, all of these prophecies are fine and dandy and wonderful for those of us who are mature Christians. But if you want to talk to someone else, you, we best tell them what Jesus has done for me, and they'll listen.
Please turn in your hymn books to hymn 212. Tis almost time for the Lord to come. Hymn 212. Following the benediction, then Alex will play a, another uh, piece on her uh, saxophone. And I uh, appreciate all of the music. I appreciate the prayer, Ruth, that you did, and the story, Verla, and all the reading. Um, and I would like to hear that again next time we further take up this topic of the trumpets. Hymn 212. Shofar, please sound. Play your E flat. The call to prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you care and love so much for us that you will do anything to get our attention. May we pay attention and may we daily enlarge this relationship with you we thank you that you are trustworthy that you care for us every moment of every day go with us as we leave this place and may we always remain in your presence in jesus name amen please be seated